Well, good morning. I am. Um, I appreciate that. I uh, I've been thrilled uh, for weeks now about this opportunity to speak to you guys, and uh, I, and the reason. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the re- is that Kevin? Okay, I figured it was. I figured it was. I I thought he. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I I really love this church. I really do. And when I say that, I'm saying I love you because you are netcast, right? And uh, and so just grateful to be here. This morning, I'm preaching all the services, and you guys are crazy. Yeah, <laughs> you guys are crazy. Y'all do like a 1,000 services, so pray for me. I haven't done that in like six years or so. Three services is a lot. But uh, before I jumped in, I wanted to give you a little more context to, to who I am and echo some of the things that have been said. And so my name is Cody. I'm planting Freedom Church in Gloucester. Um, yeah. And my... So... I worked at Netcast the longest I worked at any church, um, and everything Matt said is exactly true. I did kind of force my way here, um, and uh, I don't remember if he brought the podium out, but I joked him. I said, you're assigned to me today. <laughs> so it was good. It was good. Um, but my wife, Lindsay, who's, who's right there, you can wave, uh, she, we, we met in this church at a worship night in a house, and uh, actually... Uh, Uncle Dan, Dan Bird, who was uh, used to be an elder here, introduced us. And when I met Lindsay, I knew we were going to get married, uh, literally. And we got married within 10 months of knowing each other. Um, af- it was actually like a week after we started dating, we were on the tuning's couch like, hey, I think we're going to get married. And uh, he was like, okay, let's talk about that, right? Like it was the whole thing. Um, we started our family uh, in this church. Uh, Car Car was... Not born literally in the church, but, uh, but literally he was born while we were here. Um, and also, I discovered my call for Gloucester in this church. Um, and, and so it has been. It's been like eight years in the making. And so that song, um, What God Starts, He Finishes, I think that's how it went. Uh, but like I, that hit me in that moment. Like, yeah, that's true. That's my story, right? Um, and so I, I consider myself kind of like, in, my, in terms of my relationship with Netcast, like the, the cousin who comes to the family barbecue that you really don't know what to do with, but he's family, so he gets to come. That's me with neck ass. I get to come because I'm family, and you know, you may not know what to do with me, but it just is what it is. Um, but uh, even though I love this church so much, I am called to, to, to Gloucester and to do church planning there. And, um, you know, next week we are starting weekly services. And so I'm. Like, I'm all the emotions, like, literally uh, excited, terrified, like, all of this stuff. There's been so much going on. We have this potential to, to get this building, and so it's, like, all this stuff. And so I just want to say pray pray for us. Pray for my family. Um, Lindsay and I were talking this week. It's never been, we've never been this busy as we are now, um, and so it's been a big adjustment. But I do also want to say thank you to guys. Thank you to you guys, because I don't know if you know this or not, but if it wasn't for NetCast, the last, uh, we did preview services, so like monthly services for the last five months, we would have been in a tight spot if it wasn't for you. Um, you guys, it was uh, the Connections team showed up and showed out at a lot of our events, um, some of our services, and kind of filled in the gaps for us, um, because the whole point of the preview services was to start building community, and, um, and it worked, right? We, we baptized three lo- uh, local gloss people, and then uh, we have two more to baptize. We, we have a, yeah. We have around, uh, our core is around 35 now, and so all of that happened because of you. So I just want to say thank you. Zane, also, I have no clue what to do with, like, this production technology. Um, And so I've been talking to Zane a lot, like, hey, the soundboard, do I just turn it on? Like, how does that that work, right? And uh, so so thank you guys so much. But I get to start this new series today, and I'm excited about it because I haven't started a new series in Netcast in probably... Oh, man, probably five years or so. And so, but I, I remember the slogan when I was here on staff. Um, I think it was created around Generous Bunny. I don't remember if anyone back then remembers. But, uh, but I remember this being a thing. And I love it because it's so neckcast. It's like the swag of like, we are neckcast. Like, you know, it's just, it's the most neckcast thing ever. And I love it. And, uh, but we're talking about, and you're going to hear me say we a lot. Because again, like cousin at the barbecue, just deal with it. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about this idea of, of the, really the pillars of what defines the NetCast family, 
right? And, and the things that we are, the things that we do um, as, as a church and as a, as a family. And so, um, and a lot of what we do in freedom is, is the DNA is, is very similar as well. And so, but, you know, today we're going to talk about this idea of we are missionaries. And, uh, and it, you know, it's kind of close to my heart because I'm, I'm a church planner. But all of us are missionaries. And, and what we're going to really dive into is the why, why we're missionaries. And because uh, and I, I really think that a lot of us don't really understand the why. And so my hope is to kind of, if you will, just paint this full picture so we can see it. And then when we leave this amazing facility, we can go and actually be a missionary wherever we go. And so I want to pray for us, and we'll jump in. I usually pray before I start. It's, it's probably more about me than it is you. Just want to trying to, you know, get my heart right um, before we dive into God's Word. We will be in 2 Corinthians 5, so if you have, have a physical Bible, who actually has a physical Bible here? Dang, y'all super Christians. Um, I don't even do quiet time with the physical Bible. I do it with the, my phone and the notes app, but anyways, let me pray. Jesus, I, uh, God, I, I really, um, God, you know my heart and just how excited I was to, to be back here and, and to preach and but my heart in this moment, God, is to communicate your word in a way that Jesus is made so clearly the picture of who he is and what he's called us to do as Christians. And so, God, my, my prayer is that you would remove any barriers, anything that would distract us from that beautiful truth of what you've done in our lives and what you're calling us to. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, so when I was growing up, I used to hate when my parents would tell me to do something um, well, in general, I hated that too. But, uh, but when they would tell me to do something and then I would ask why, they would say the classic parent statement. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Because, because, yeah, because I said so. So annoying. So annoying when you're a kid. And, when I, was, and I said to myself, I am never going to do that when I'm a kid. See, you guys know. You know exactly what happened. And then I became a parent. And I had two and three-year-olds. And that's when it really starts coming out, right, where it's just like, they, they confuse you half the time, and, and then you're frustrated, and you don't know what to do. And, and uh, like, my, my two-year-old, um, he, I'll never forget this. This is so funny. He asked me to go get him water. So I was like, okay, I'll go, uh, buddy, of course. So I got up. I got him some water. I came back. I said, buddy, here's your water. And he responded by saying, why? <laughs> and, I, and I said, did you think I wanted to get up? Like, I was perfectly fine on my phone. Like, I didn't want to leave, and, 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 and then actually, it was uh, months ago, um, they were, I think they were both involved, so I have a, a six-year-old uh, Carter who's here in the, the auditorium with us today, he wanted to hear me preach, um, and then I have the, he's almost three, so in two weeks, he's three. I think I was telling them to do something, and again, as a parent, you know how sometimes you just, you get frustrated, right, and you're like, just go do this. I don't remember what it was, but I just remember saying, go do this. And they responded, well, why? And I just said it. Because I, I said so. That's why. I'm the parent. You're the kid. You do what I say. That's how this works. Right? That's how this whole exchange works. And, uh, and it was in that moment that I just, I felt so old. Like, it hit me. Like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I really have, have become my, my parents. Um, I was thinking this week how we do that in the church. Like, as Christians and pastors, what we do is, we do something similar in that we'll take the commands of Jesus. And instead of really explaining the beauty of, of why Jesus is saying what he's saying, we just say, because Jesus said so. And we do that with the topic of being a missionary. And so when I say missionary, I'm not talking about necessarily moving to like Africa or a third world country, but you could do that, right? That's part of being a missionary. But it's just this idea of like sharing your faith with people, sharing, sharing Jesus, sharing the gospel, right, the good news of Jesus and what he's done in our life, sharing your story with people, being open, the fact that you are with Jesus, right? That's what being a missionary is. And I just feel like a lot of us have this understanding and, and how we handle it is like, well, Jesus said to do it. That's why I do it. Now, I, I will be clear. That is why you should do it, right? Like, I'm not saying that it's not a good enough reason, but what I'm trying to say is it doesn't really paint the full picture of why we're doing it. And so for some of us, we, because we lack kind of the real understanding of, of why Jesus is telling us this, 
why this is so important. We don't see it as important. We don't really see the point in it, right? We, we just kind of are like whatever about it, if we can get to it, if we have time for it, right? Or, or what people will say is, well, like, I'm not really good at that, so, like, it makes me nervous, so I, I don't need to do it. And, see, and the problem is, the problem with that is, is what's happening is we, we're being crappy missionaries, and we're not really doing the thing that Jesus is telling us to do. And, and as a result, like, we live in an area where there's so much need for us to be missionaries, right? Yeah. I mean, I would say it's everywhere. But, like, specifically New England, there's not, like, there's a lot of hostility towards God. And a lot of us, we just don't really do it because it's like, and, and what I want to do is just explain fully that full picture. And I believe if we can grasp that. I think it'll really help you, help you kind of take that step uh, towards it. So we'll go to 2 Corinthians. Um, you can turn there in your Bible. We'll be in chapter 5. The uh, Apostle Paul wrote this. He wrote most of the New Testament. Um, and the church of Corinth was crazy. Uh, so they had a lot of issues, a lot of different um, things going on. And so a lot of what Paul does in First and 2 Corinthians is really correcting them, really calling them out. Um, he's trying to pastor them towards Jesus, right, because they had a lot of different issues. But in chapter 5, what, what we're, what's happening here is Paul is actually explaining why he does what he does. Now, Paul's a missionary, right? He's a church planner. And so he's explaining to them, hey, listen, this is why I do what I do. This is why I am about what I'm about. This is why I'm going about things the way that I am. And, but what he says here, because we have the, the whole counsel of God's word, we know it's, it's applicable to all of us. You don't need to be a church planner. Like, all of us are technically, I don't know if we're technically, yeah, we're church planners. We're all missionaries, right? That's what it is, right? And so let's jump in, verse 13. Um, let's read this together and see what Paul has to tell us. For if we are beside ourselves for God, or if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. I love that. He's literally saying, if I'm crazy for God, it's for him. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but don't miss this, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. He's speaking about the life of Jesus. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the f- flesh, we, we, regard him the, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and trusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. I love that. We implore you on the behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so Paul, I love how he starts here because he's like, he basically says, look, I am crazy for God. He, he's owning it. He's like, I'm crazy for God. The love of God controls him. In other words, it motivates him. It's the why he does what he does and why he's so crazy, right? Because what he's describing is that Christ died and was raised. And through that, he is now with Jesus. His life has been changed. So he's out of his mind for God. And then he talks about this idea of if we're all, if, if we're in Christ, if anyone in this room is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And he's given us this gift, this gift of the ministry of reconciliation. So there's a lot being said here. And so what, what I want to do is unpack it a little bit further as we continue. And, I, and I'm going somewhere with this. But here, here's, because here's the problem. There's a lot of good stuff being said here. But in order to understand the magnitude of all the good stuff, you really got to understand the bad stuff and the problem that Paul is pointing out. 
And see, the problem that he's pointing out is that people in the world, people outside of Christ, are born at odds with God. They are born in a constant hostile nature towards God. See, he's saying that God is reconciling the world to himself. Why? Because the current state of the world is at odds with him. The idea of reconciliation is just this idea of bringing two parties together into harmony. And we're born with hostility towards God. And the reason is because of sin. I don't know if you know this. I'm going to assume you do because this is neck ass. <laughs> sin is the problem. Right? It says in Romans 3, this won't come on the screen, but it, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person in the world. And again, listen, I don't need to, you know this, right? Like, again, I love my kids, but you see it in kids, right? You see it play out over and over again. They, they, they disobey and they do that because of the sinful nature in them. They were born with this. And see, this goes all the way back to, to Adam and Eve. When God created everything, they were in perfect harmony with God and each other, and then they disobeyed a holy God. And the moment that happened, sin became a part of mankind. And it was such a problem. It was like a disease that the Bible says it would pass through the seed of man. So because of their fall, we are fallen, and we're born into this reality of sin. Sin is missing the mark of God's holiness. It's it's lacking the submission to God's holiness, however you want to define it. The moment Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, the world and the people in it were broken. And see, because of the sin, and this is where it gets really tragic. Remember, God created us to be in harmony with him. But sin, what happened in Isaiah 59, it tells us our iniquities created separation with God. In Romans 8, it says our flesh is hostile towards God. So what happened is, is the moment sin came in our hearts, we have this nature in us that is hostile and separated from God. But it gets even worse because sin produces death, and we were created to live with God forever. In Romans 6, it says the wages of sin is death. We were never created to experience that in this world, but the moment we operated outside of God's design and disobeyed a holy God, separation, hostility, war, all of those things became a part of the human story, along with death and decay. God created us, just think about this, to be with him, to know him, to be in harmony with one another, and sin changed all of that. And we get this. If we look at our world around us, there are mental health issues, There's addiction, there's war, there's affairs, there's mass shootings, sexual perversion, on and on. All of that is a result of the fall. And because of that hostility and separation from God, this is the part that breaks my heart because I remember this feeling, is that people are searching for some sort of fulfillment. They have this craving in them that they're born with, and what it is, in a corny way, it's, you know, it's said to be the God-sized hole in our souls. Because we were created to be with him in his image. And because we're separated, hostile, hostile towards him and at odds with him, there's this thing that we know is missing. And so we do everything we can to try to fulfill it. But it never seems to be enough. Amen. Because it's not. The things we're trying to fulfill it with are not the things that were designed to fulfill it because God is the only being that can do that for us because we are his children. But there's good news. (laughs) And what we see here is that Jesus is the good news, that Jesus came to reconcile people back to God. So keep, keep following me this. It says here that God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God, right? And so what... What Paul is pointing out is the the mission and life of Jesus. The whole point of Jesus coming was to do what we couldn't do, to be born of a virgin, not born like us, not born with the sinful nature, to uphold the law inside and out, to be holy and walk this earth, and then go to the cross as the perfect atonement, to step in between us and God's wrath towards sin, because God loved us and didn't want to crush us because it would destroy us. 
But Jesus stepped in the way as the perfect atonement. He died, and on the cross, he says, it is finished. Sin has been overcome through the death of Jesus. But the news is so good that not only did Jesus overcome sin, he overcame, he overcame the result of sin, which is death, because he was God. And that'll, you guys are going to do a series about that. I don't know. I don't, yeah, I don't, we'll let, we'll let Travis talk about that. Um, and when Jesus got up from the grave, what did he say? Did he, did he look at mankind and, and flex and, and say, look what I did? No, he said, I love them. And I want them. And if we, if anyone trusts me, Jesus says, then through me, my death and resurrection, the Holy Spirit will come and and reconcile them back to God. And that's that's the good news of the God. When we say gospel, that's what we mean, right? And see, the Garden of Eden, the Holy Spirit is bringing us back to that, to where we can walk and know God, the God who created the stars. You know, last night I was walking, I was looking at the ocean in Gloucester, and I'm thinking, God, you made all of this. That God, through our faith in Jesus, we can walk and talk with him. God made the way back to God through the person of Jesus. And now, that craving and thirst in us can be fulfilled because God restores us. He brings us into harmony with him. Think about that weariness that you had before you met Jesus. And I'm not saying that you always walked around with a frown. I'm saying that there was just something in you that you knew that no matter what you did, you just had trouble trying to make sense of all of it. That thing is now satisfied in you because you have the creator of the stars with you. And he loves you. Like, that's the thing that blows my mind. Is that God not only recognizes, like, he, act, he just loves us. He just wants us. So he literally pushed everything out of the way just so we can know him. Because he knew we didn't have what it takes to get back to God. Yeah. And so God saves us. He reconciles us. And then what does he do? And this is the thing that blows my mind. He says, those he reconciled are his ambassadors. God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the broken people that I saved, and I'm going to make my appeal to the rest of the broken people who I am. You know, ambassador means that it's like this idea of, you know, ambassadors, they, they, they speak for a king or a country, right? They don't speak for themselves. They, they don't speak for an audience. Their one role is to speak for a king or whatever they're representing. And our gift as Christians is to represent the king of kings to the entire world. Yeah. That we get to bring this message that says, yeah, Jesus loves everyone. And he made a way that we can actually know and walk and talk with God again. He actually decided, my best strategy is to take the people that are broken, and I'm going to use those people and make my appeal to the rest of the world. In Acts 1, this is the, I think this is like the last thing Jesus said um, in verse 6. It said, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you come at this time and restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But look what he says. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, the disciples thought that Jesus was going to be like this this king in this world. Like he was going to establish some kingdom on earth. But what Jesus had in mind was the kingdom of God. And his whole play this whole time, was to make the disciples, the followers of Jesus, his ambassadors, his witnesses. A a witness here is is talking about this idea of like an expert witness who goes to court. They they just know a topic, right? So they go and declare to the judge what's going on with a particular topic. And that's who we are. That's who Jesus says that we are. So here's, here's what I'm saying. We were born separated at odds with God, 
But Jesus intervened, not because of us. We were dead in our sins and saved us. And now he said, okay, go tell the world what I did in you. God has chosen us to bring the message of Jesus to a world that desperately needs it. And when I say desperately needs it, please understand that that is my emphasis today. See, when you leave this space today, you are carrying the name of Jesus everywhere you go, to your school, to your workplaces, to your families. God has given you the responsibility. He's entrusted this message with you to go share and represent him. And there's a lot at stake here. This isn't just some callous task Jesus has given us to kind of give us something to do before we die and go to heaven. Like there, there is people in our lives that absolutely need the hope that we have. They need the joy that you have. They need the love that you have, the forgiveness that you have. Do you remember what it was like before you met Jesus? That, that was the whole point. Paul's saying, I'm out of my mind for him. I, I, I'm an ambassador. I want to go. And he's telling us to do the same thing because of the fact that he's just changed us and he saved us, like rescued us from a path that we were going down. How dare we keep this to ourselves? Like we have the best message in the world. This is the most important task ever. You know, when I, I'm a big Apple guy and when I hear Steve Jobs talk about how much intentionality went into the iPhone and how it, it did change the world, but I'm like, for an iPhone. But like, we are entrusted with the gospel, Amen. the message that literally rescues people from separation of the God who created the stars. Like, what are we doing? I'll share, I want to share a story with you. Um, there was a man who grew up in an alcoholic family. His, uh, his parents were always at the bar to the point where his older sisters basically had to take care of him. And this man was never really open about his childhood and his upbringing. But those around him could put it together, right? We know those people. We could put it together that, that some stuff went down. And so this man would actually grow up to be an alcoholic and a drug addict. He was trying to make sense of the world around him. And uh, he would actually go on to, to find a wife and have some kids. But the marriage um, and the kids didn't fix him. He really struggled to cope with life and, and the meaning of life and all that entails about life. Now, he would always provide for his family, but he would also always have a bottle in his hand, trying to fulfill something in him. And sometimes he would be gone on the weekends for drug binges. And then a massive moment happened in his life where his mother died and left, a, left him a house. And so the man took his family and they moved from New England to the South. Unfortunately, the lifestyle that he had gotten used to followed him there. And it actually only got worse. And then one day, a local pastor showed up at his house. And the man was ready to change. He just didn't know what to do. So the pastor helped him go to a Christian rehab. The man went, and for the first time in his life, he heard the gospel. And Jesus changed his life and changed the landscape of his family. Now, this didn't mean his family was perfect after he became a Christian. Matter of fact, his youngest son would go on to do drugs himself. But because the man had laid a foundation in his family about Jesus, and he had, known, he had experienced Jesus himself, when his youngest son became addicted, he knew, he knew what to do. And at age 18, his youngest son came into his room and said in, in tears that he, he needed help. And so the man knew that the, what the son didn't need was, was self-help or anything like that, what, what, what his son needed was Jesus. And because of the man's upbringing, he didn't really know what to do and how to commu So what he did was is he brought his son to the same rehab that he had went to. Now the son was terrified. He cried the whole way 
to rehab, but knew he needed to go. And the man said to his son, wait on the miracle. The first night in rehab, a woman from the community came up to the man's son and said, I just want you to know that God loves you. And a few nights later, the son would believe in Jesus, and his life was changed forever. His son would leave rehab and feel a call into ministry. And he would begin to process, process that with people, process that with people, and you know, the man was so excited because as long as he could remember, the men in the family were drunks and addicts not preachers. And so one day he had a conversation with his son and said, isn't it crazy that we had to come to the South to become Christians? It wasn't crazy, it was sad. And so his son, feeling like he was being called to go to New England, to maybe plant a church, through the course of different events, his son got connected to a church called Netcast. I don't think I can finish it, but here's what I'm going to tell you. That man was my father. I, I sometimes wonder what would have happened if that pastor never showed up. And, and I know some of you, <laughs> some of you theology people would say, well, God will make rock talks. He'll make a wall talk to share Jesus with people. And I believe that, but why should he have to? When he has us. What if that woman never came to rehab? You know, my, one of my biggest issues before I met Jesus was I didn't think God loved me. And, and the, and God, that's where God started, through a person. See, our stories are not that we looked at a wall or at a rock and God made it talk. Our stories is that someone, somewhere, planted a seed about Jesus in your life. And your families are different because of it. And... Uh, I know some of you are thinking, Cody, just, I want to do it. Tell me how to be a missionary. Like, tell me how. I get the why. And I refuse to tell you how. Here's why. Because what you're asking for is a formula. And there is no formula. The, the whole thing about this being a missionary is walking with Jesus and trusting him. Allowing him to make his appeal through you. And if I try to give you a formula, if I try to tell you this, this what is it, Roman, the Romans road or something, then, then all you'll do is focus on that and you won't depend on Jesus. See, there's people in your life that they don't need some presentation. What they need is a friend who prays for them, who, who comes up to them and says, I'm there for you. Hey, I have Jesus. Like, that's the stuff that matters. And so I don't, don't look for a formula. Just trust and walk with Jesus, that was the reason why Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come and then you'll be my witnesses. If you try to be a missionary without the Holy Spirit, it's not gonna go well. As a matter of fact, you'll probably do more damage to the church than you will anything. You have to trust Jesus and walk with him. But the point is, is that God can use you and there are people that need it. There are people that need it. You know, I think of the guy who led Billy Graham to Christ. I can't pronounce his first name. I'm going to call him Evangelist Ham. Does anyone know who his first name is? Okay. Like, who would have thought that Billy Graham would be Billy Graham? Like, what if Ricky Graham never shared the gospel with Matt Tuning on the street? Would this exist? Maybe. Maybe. 
We don't know. But what we do know is Ricky Grant did. And God used Matt Tuning to build a great church. Now, it's his church, and Matt knows that, and I'm, I know that. But he used him. He used the grind of church planning to, to do this. Do you realize how unique this is? What could God do in, with your neighbor, with your coworker? You have no clue who, what God wants to do in their life. All you know is that you have a call to do something and to share. I'll close with this. In, in Psalms 96, the psalmist says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all of earth and sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. That's, let's do that. When we leave here today, let's actually take this call seriously and begin thinking through, God, who are these people that need what I have? And so as we're closing today, we're going to worship through song again, and we're going to participate in communion. And, and my heart for you is during this time, don't waste it. Ask God, God, do, you need, do I need to repent of this? Have I been a crappy missionary? Who in my family and in my life, what coworkers need what I have? And God, I'm going to trust you to show me how. And of course, if you get tripped up, if you don't know, if there's a tricky situation, yeah, of course, talk to your pastors. You have a thousand staff people, you have no excuse. No excuse. <laughs> like you have, you have plenty of help. Yes, do those things, but trust God, all right? And so what I want to do is I don't, I vaguely remember how to do communion. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it and just do what I say. So if it's a little different, then I'll correct it next service. Um, so if you guys want to stand uh, with me. So when we, communion is a beautiful moment of worship. And, and I hope you understand that. This is not like just some, some appetizers before your lunch, okay? Amen. The bread is symbolic of his death. The juice is symbolic of his blood. The death of Jesus. And we just talked about what that means. So as you're coming forward, I'm, pray, I'm hoping that you're praying through as we're worshiping and singing, God, how, how do I respond to this? as I leave these doors, okay? And so what I'm gonna tell you to do is go off your right down and go up your left, okay? I think that's right, okay? <laughs> ah, you got it. I'm a little rusty, it's been a while. But let me pray for us and then we're gonna continue in a time of worship. Jesus, your word is true. Your commands are real. And I pray that people didn't just hear that you said to do it, but they hear why. They hear the full picture, they see it, and they, they, they leave here inspired to go be an ambassador for you, to go take the beautiful news of the gospel to the people in their life, Jesus. And I pray that you would anoint every single one of us to be used by you. Bring those people to our minds, Jesus. It's in your name I pray, amen. amen.